very welcome again, Professor Fitzmaier, for your <coughs> final lecture this morning. And perhaps you will stay somewhat longer even to enjoy yourself uh, uh, with some things after your lecture. Uh, but let's first listen to your third topic, which concerns as far, at least as it has been designed, perhaps you have changed yourself a little bit topic, but it has been designed as being a lecture concerning the topic time and transcendental critique. And we are very uh, 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 looking forward to what you have to tell us this morning. Please take the chance. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will indeed uh, discuss those two topics during this view of time and what is called by in the transcendental critique. Um, but I must make a preliminary remark because uh, the first two lectures were already uh, introductory, sketchy, and certainly not complete and going into details. And having to deal with two different topics, although they do relate, uh, yeah, I hope that I will be clear enough um, that I'm not doing injustice to Doivier's thinking, but even more that I'm not doing justice to you, injustice to you, because I am too demanding in trying to tell too much in too little time. Um, there is another remark I'd like to make before I use my time to talk about Doivier's view of time. And that is that um, you should be aware of the fact that these three lectures are more an introduction into Doiridian philosophy than into the philosophy of Doirid. What I mean by that is that uh, in my presentation uh, I make use of my own appropriation of Doiridian thinking. Uh, of course, everyone who gives a lecture about somebody is doing that. Um, but I'm not so much interested in these introductory lectures to make always a clear distinction uh, between how a theme is presented by Doiviert in his own context and how I think it is fruitful in our contemporary discussion. Um, I think in those cases, I am fair to do it here, but I should make clear that there is my own appropriation and the way I think it is fruitful. Uh, as I was asked by uh, Donald to say something about my own position in relation to do it here, uh, the whole idea of uh, the transcendental critique uh, gives a good opportunity to say something about the differences I will just give a short remark on that at the end, so that you realize uh, that there are some differences, and in some sense there are the basic differences between my position and Doiwitz's position. But it didn't think, uh, it didn't seem to me worthwhile uh, to bother you with all differences between Doiwitz's philosophy himself and the critique on that, because I think that was not fitting in this situation. Now then, first about Doiwitz's view of time. Uh, in fact, it is good to talk about that idea because uh, Doiwitz himself characterized once his philosophy as a new philosophical conception of time. So in Doiwitz, his idea of time is rather crucial. Um, although I must again say in relation to the remark I just made that uh, certain elements of Doiwitz's view of time, I may touch at the end a little bit, but I will leave them out and stress especially what I think is, is very worthwhile in his view of time. And maybe it's good to start uh, here that in the lectures that I gave before, the first and the second, I made probably the 
impression that David's theory or structural theory about reality is rather static. Uh, that, that you could say it's, it's, it's kind of a, a framework that applies uh, independent of time. It's synchronic and not diachronic. And uh, in fact, that is a way that you can look at his uh, analysis, his structural analysis, but basically it, it misses the point because there is a strong dynamics in his structural analysis and that's related to the concept of time. Um, I will come back to that in a moment. It relates to what I mentioned before, the idea of opening up or disclosure and also the meaning of history in this respect I will talk about. But first I like to uh, draw the attention to something else and that is that I think generally we tend to think, at least in our Western cultures, that time is especially physical time. Time as can be measured by a clock in whatever precise way the clock we have in a room or the watch we have on our wrist or the, the much more refined uh, clocks that are used in physics. But time is something that you can measure in a physical way. Um, Doivit's view of time uh, is quite different. The modal diversity, the diversity in the reality of the, the 15 or so modal aspects, uh, is related to his idea of time in a sense that time manifests itself in a specific way in all the aspects. So time is not just physical time, but time can be uh, biotic time, psychological time, historical time, moral time. Uh, so in all the aspects there is a specific manifestation of time. Let me try to expand a little bit on that too to show that this is basically rather trivial, you could say, or not trivial in terms of analysis, but it's basically a part of our everyday experience. That, that this view of time is very close to our experience of time, although we often are not aware of that in our reflection. <coughs> If you think of the way that we experience uh, the sequence of time in our everyday life, then you could immediately think of the difference between day and night as a, as a pattern that is repeated all the time on. Now you could say that day and night is still very much a physical aspect of time. Uh, it relates to light, it relates, it relates to the movement of uh, the sun, the moon, the earth. So you could still analyze that very much in a physical way. <coughs> but at the same time, I think everybody is aware that if we speak about the rhythm of day and night, that is not just something physical. Because when we talk about our experience of it, then there is already the psychological effect. And it's clear in, in research that if uh, the rhythm of dark and light, of day and night, is disrupted in such a way that either people stay in a dark room without any rhythm of light and dark, or they stay in light without that, is that rhythm, that they get disoriented. So in, in the experience of day and night, there is certainly a psychological aspect to it. It's not just physical, it's also psychological. And it's not just psychological, there is a biotic element there too. That the way our organism works, there is kind of a biological clock, which is not exactly 24 hours, it seems to be a little bit more of that. But the rhythm of our daily life uh, follows that, and when we move to another country uh, by plane and we have a jet lag, then that rhythm is disturbed. That's not physical time, that's biological time. So time is expressed much wider 
than just physical time that you measure by a clock. There's kind of a temporal rhythm in our reality, in our experience. And that's what we live in. Another example, that's historical time, the way we use it. Uh, an illustration, you can go to certain countries, uh, for instance the Middle East, and uh, have the feeling that time has not progressed there since, say, a thousand years. Uh, in a historical sense, there have been developments in our Western culture, in Asian cultures, and there are other cultures that time seems to have stood still, not developed. Of course, in a physical sense it went on, in a biological sense it went on, but in historical sense, and that's not kind of an evaluation in a moral sense at all, but in a historical sense you can say certain cultures have stayed behind and maybe in some respects they are better off than our Western culture. But there is a specific way that you can speak of historical time, which is not identical with physical time. Another illustration, a time in a moral sense. Sometimes you are, we are in a situation that morally it is very urgent to do something when someone needs our help. And, and the, then in a moral sense it might be very urgent to help. Now that's temporal in a moral sense. So time expresses itself <coughs> in the rich diversity that Doivet analyzes in his theory of modal aspects, which gives a much richer view of time than time taken in a physical sense. It doesn't mean that physical time is not real or that it is not even basic as in the order of aspects physical. The physical comes before the many others. But it does show that time is much richer in our experience than physical time as such. Now here there is also some discussion, and I, I won't go into that, but I just mention it. As Doivit says that time manifests itself in all the modal aspects. What about the numerical? And what about the spatial? Now, Doivet would claim that time manifests itself also in the numerical aspects, in the order of numbers. Uh, some people uh, argue against that, that the order of numbers is not of before and after, but is of less and more. That was uh, Volnover's opinion uh, in the second phase. First, he had also that impression. Now, I leave that uh, open. Uh, it, it shows that there is some discussion, but <coughs> I'd like to make some other remark in relation to time, basically to, uh, to add a little bit on its importance, that not only it's more uh, open to the way we experience time in our daily life than the reduction to physical time, but there are the two other sides also. And the first is that Doivet's appreciation of time is basically positive, and which is clear from the whole analysis. If time manifests itself in so different ways in all the modal aspects, then there is a rich diversity in the experience of time, in the reality of time, and that's something positive. Uh, even if time always implies change transition. This is not something negative for Doivet. If you compare that with the view of time in Greek philosophy, which also has influenced Christian theology rather much, then there is a real change, because in Greek philosophy time is basically something negative. Change is negative in relation to what is unchangeable. Time is efficient in relation to what is eternal. The temporal is deficient in relation to what is unchangeable, eternal, <coughs> and often <coughs> related to the unity, the oneness of perfect being and diversity. Now, in, in this approach, the appreciation of time is basically positive. If 
the created world is temporal, then that is not something negative, something a deficiency, but it's the positive nature of what is created. Now, of course, in, in our modern times, there is a, a different appreciation of time often than in Greek philosophy. Um, but then still, people might sometimes tend to think that, that because time is related to passing by, going on, that eternity in the experience of the moment is still something that is to preferred beyond uh, or above what goes on, what is passing by. And there still you have that idea that the temporal has a, some negative character that, that is deficient in relation to eternity. In the appreciation of time in the Dolivarian approach, this is not so. The temporal nature of created reality is not something negative. We should not uh, evaluate created reality in terms of, and even there you could have a discussion, in what is divine, and divine then especially in the Greek philosophical sense. But even from a Christian framework, I think it's, it's not helpful to evaluate what is created in terms of the character of the creator. That if the creature is different from the creator, in that respect, it is deficient. It is not perfect. No, the creation should be assessed in terms of the standards for what is created and not of the creator. That was the first remark after I presented something of the view of time. The second one is um, that in the Greek view of time, time is very much taken uh, in the sense of what David calls the manifestations of time in nature. It's the natural order, say the cycle of day and night, the cycle of years. Uh, so there is very much in Greek philosophy a psychical view of time. Now our view of time of course is different, it's, it's not psychical, it's kind of linear. And the linear view has its uh, limitations too, as I uh, already explained in terms of the different rhythms that are there. But there is another element there, and that is that uh, in the view of time in Doiwier, there is an emphasis on time in a historical sense. Now you could understand the historical time as a linear development. But there is another element there, and that is that uh, there is a meaning to temporal development. Uh, not in the sense of the idea of progress, as it was related, or was defended by the Enlightenment, that there is kind of a, an intrinsic progress in time. Uh, of course, that idea is not uh, or I'd like to put it this way, that idea of the progress in time cannot be understood apart from the biblical view of history, that history leads somewhere, but then of course it's not something intrinsic in time, but it's because time is in the hands of God. But there is an element in the biblical view that relates time indeed to history and to God's goal intention with history, uh, the promise of God and the acts of God of redemption, and then the acts of God of redemption that are remembered. And uh, in that sense, in a sense that in that way they, they maintain their meaning. Uh, so the, story, the feasts in the Old Testament, if you read the text carefully, you find that from kind of a natural feast, uh, for instance, of the harvest, that they get a historical meaning, referring to certain historical events, like the Exodus and Passover. So they, they really refer to what God did in history and they become kind of a promise for the future. It's got redeeming acts 
that are important in history. So there again you have that element that, that the temporal development is not just something neutral, but that it has meaning and that it's even part of the way God works in this world, in his creation, that, that it leads to something. Now, this much about the, the, the view of time in general. And now I go on on that element of historical development. And <clears throat> because Doyle's view of time um, also affects very much his idea of the structures that I discussed in the other two lectures. The modal aspects with their specific structures of their specific nature and the way they are related to the other aspects. The typical structures of things, like the kind of trivial examples, the tree and the bird's nest, but also the more relevant examples, the social structures, they are not kind of eternal essences or structures that are there from the very beginning of creation. Nee, they are creational structures, but they are structures in time. They, they develop in a temporal development. Uh, let me <coughs> two are uh, some illustrations of, in relation to the natural world, or without limiting it to the natural world, and then go on especially to history in <coughs> the sense of human culture. Um, in doing its philosophy, the kingdom, say the kingdom of the physical things, the kingdom of the vegetarian, yeah, can you say it? of vegetation, plants, trees, the animal kingdom, and then humankind, uh, they appear in the course of time after one another. Though it himself does not accept an evolutionary explanation for this sequence in time, so it's not kind of evolution theory. Uh, some others think a little bit different about that in terms of a scientific explanation, but uh, let's leave that out for a second, but that they appear in the course of time is important in Doivet's view. And of course, Genesis 1 says the same. If one comes after the other. But if the natural kingdom comes first, plants, animals, and then mankind, that means that there is also some disclosure of, say, the natural kingdom, when another kingdom appears. The physical things do not, are not opened up in their meaning for organic life until the kingdom of the living organisms is there. The structures of living organisms are not opened up in relation to consciousness, feeling, until the, king, the animal kingdom is there. The, the psychic structures of the animal world are not opened up in the human sense of logical analysis, moral responsibility, until the human person appears. So the, the structures are opened up in the course of time. And, and they get new dimensions, you could say. Water is necessary for a living organism, but that element in water is only developed when that kingdom of vegetation appears. And so you can give many other illustrations. In a modal sense, more abstract, uh, you remember that I, I mentioned in the first lecture that there is a specific character uh, Tom de Raad calls that the essence of a modal aspect, the nuclear meaning, and that it refers to, it back to the earlier modal aspect and it refers forward to the later modal aspect. But you can find in the reality a modal aspect, of course in an abstract analysis, when do I would call it in a closed form, that the references to the later aspects are not opened up yet. 
they are not realized. You don't find them in specific structures. You find them only in specific contexts. So there too is, is the idea of time, opening up, disclosure, uh, that is necessary to do justice to the analysis of the modal aspects, the specific structure. Uh, and let me give now an illustration of this and that leads to uh, time, history and human development. An illustration uh, of such an <coughs> anticipation that is realized in uh, the human situation. Uh, as far as I know, it, it's kind of a general observation that there has been a stage in the history of human culture that um, law, in, in a sense of criminal law, let's take that as an illustration, was applied in a rather restricted way someone was judged guilty if he was the physical cause of a certain uh, event. If, if someone had uh, done something uh, even by accident and that led to the death of another person, he was guilty because it was the physical cause as such, the physical relationship that was determinative. Now, I'm not trying to be unfair to those civilizations, so it's an illustration and I realize that in, in actuality the situation might be much more complex. But it is that you look at even a cause-effect relationship in a legal sense very much in terms of the physical cause-effect relationship and how far there was the intention of the person, if he can really be uh, held responsible for it, that was not so much at stake. Now, in our civilizations, we, I think every judge would take that into account. Now, you could say that <coughs> the legal uh, aspect was functioning in the former phase of human civilization in a restricted way. The, the moral anticipation uh, of responsibility in a moral sense, intentions, was not opened up yet. And in the course of time that is opened up. And that, of course there is a positive side to it, but let me add immediately, of course this can also be misused. So the opening up in a structural sense as positive is not necessarily positive in an overall meaning, because it can be misused in, in a morally or even legal uh, anti-normative sense. And, and so at one side you can say that the, the whole idea of temporal development, opening up of reality in a structural sense, has something positive in it. You wouldn't like to go back to an earlier situation. But at the same time, this is not progress in an overall sense. Because at the same time, the brokenness of reality, the evil nature of mankind, uh, is expressed in that structure. Now here, of course, uh, we are talking already about human history. And I'd like to add a, a little bit on the place of history in Dewey's philosophy. <clears throat> and again, let me start very abstract and then make it more concrete and try to show the relevance of his theory in this respect. Uh, if you think of the order of the modal aspects, uh, the, so it starts with the numerical, the spatial, and then some others, the logical, and then the historical comes. And then after the historical, uh, the lingual, the social, the economic, <coughs> the aesthetic, etc. Now, in Doyle's theory of the order of the modal aspects, then uh, the aspects that come earlier are always presupposed in the specific aspect he is talking about. <coughs> Say, the logical aspect cannot be understood without the physical, without the psychic aspect. It, it, 
these three prosipations are always there. And then the logical itself is presupposed in all the aspects that come later, after the logical. <coughs> but that also applies to the historical. So in the historical aspect, uh, which Dorit characterizes as free form or formation after a free design, there is always that element of freedom, of choice, of human creativity, responsibility there. Could you repeat that? Uh, it's uh, for human formation after a free design. Mm -hmm. So there is an element of responsibility, of choice, of freedom, always implied in his, the historical model aspect. Now, in this order of aspects, then the historical uh, presupposes the physical, the psychic, the logical, the, the choice, freedom always presupposes logical distinction. So, but what I'd like to draw your attention on now is that that means in the same way that the social, the lingual, the legal, the moral, and even the credo always presuppose human formation. So, in the specific cultural sides of reality, there is always human formative activity there, which gives a strong emphasis on the meaning of history there, on the historical formation, human responsibility, a free formation according to a certain design. In that sense, you might all almost think that Doivit is leaning to historicism. That in human culture there is always the human historic activity there. But he is not a historicist, because even if there is that human activity in a historical sense, laws in the, in a legal sense and in a moral sense, there is always human formation, the way we work it out. But it doesn't mean that it's just a result of historical activity. Because there is a structural side to the moral aspect of law in a legal sense, to the moral aspect of ethics, the moral law, as there is to language. Uh, maybe language is a good illustration. Uh, the different languages that we have in the world, they always imply <coughs> some historical formation. But that doesn't mean that there are not <coughs> certain characteristics that make a language into a language. So there is always a historical side to it, but it doesn't mean that you can just reduce language as a result of human historical formation. And the same is true for law in a legal sense, in a critical sense, and to norms in a moral sense. There is that human historical formation, but always in a structural framework that is given. So Doivet can do justice to the historical side of human culture without falling into the trap that human culture is just a result of human formation or of circumstances, the result of incidental circumstances that then led to a certain aspect of culture. There is both the structural aspect and the historical side. <coughs> but that historical side is rather important. <coughs> Let me work this out in uh, some direction of, you could say, sociology, social philosophy, uh, at least social structures. Though it makes a distinction between social structures uh, that are naturally given, like a family or a marriage, you could say it, it belongs to humankind uh, that there is a family, parents with children, and that the parents have a specific relationship. Even there you could say that the way the family is institutionalized is very much a matter of historical development. In our Western world, still, I think, we are very much used to the nuclear family. Parents with their uh, younger children. 
and we think of a family in those terms. But the nuclear family as, as an institution in society, of course, is a rather recent development. Because the, the, the unit people live together in the past were much greater than just parents with the, uh, their children, their younger children. So there already there is historical uh, influence in how the institution is given form to. But still the family has a natural foundation, though I would say that the foundational aspect of the family as a societal structure is the biotic, its propagation, parents and children. But then another illustration, the state. Uh, though I wouldn't call the state a societal structure which is naturally given. And by state he then thinks of the state that we have in our, well, basically, uh, it's global, but maybe it has developed in our Western world, the national state. What is typical for the national state in its approach is that it has the monopoly of the use of violence police, the army, and that's the government of the national state that decides about the use of that. Uh, this has not always been the case, and in some situations nowadays, and that shows the problem if it's not the case, you have a situation of war lo lords. The war lords are not the government of a national state, they are certain units, but they use weapons, arms, use violence to attain their goals, but they are not a state. They might be part of a larger unity, but the government, as far as it exists, of that larger unity has not a control about the use of arms. And so by definition, but also empirically, you don't have a national state there. So, but this has developed in the course of history. The medieval system in Europe, in, in the feudal system, does not have the monopoly of the use of violence in a specific government either. There was a certain structure that controlled it, but it was not that national state. So it's a structure that has developed historically. Still, Doyle would call it a creational structure. That means that the structure is not arbitrary, that it's not something that is just invented because of certain circumstances, but there is a structural side to it. Uh, in, in that sense it's creational, not that it's from the very beginning of history there, it clearly is not, but it's founded in the structural principle of reality, which Doyle understands as God's creation, and therefore creation of structures. I should add something to it, because Doyle does not mean that the monopoly of the use of violence as such characterizes the state as the state because that would make the state into an organization of power, basically. Though it says it is the foundational structure, but the qualifying aspect is the legal one. And that means that justice, law, should be qualifying and normative for the use of power, the use of violence. In his analysis, of the structure of the state, he finds a certain relationship between justice as qualifying and power, the use of violence. Within his framework, as a foundational aspect and a qualifying aspect, he can bring them together and also show what is specific for the state in comparison with other social structures, whether it's also in some sense power, where there are also some legal norms, but where the legal side is not qualifying as such. Of course, the discussion about the relationship between power and its use and justice is not new. It didn't start with doing it. You find it in Plato's dialogue about the state very clearly already. Yeah. And then the state, not in the sense of the national state, but in the sense of politics in the city-state and the Greek situation of that time. But Plato's dialogue is also about the relationship between justice and power. And he too chooses for justice as being characteristic for the political organization and not power. So the, the, the discussion is not new. Uh, and 
as I understand, in the political philosophy of the modern times, that is a real uh, problem how to solve the relationship of those two. And at least what I read in, in, in popular statements in uh, political philosophy, people often think more in terms of power structures than in structures of justice, and that of course has to do with all kinds of things. But to come back to my main point, the national state, it has a creation of structure that can be discovered, which is not arbitrary. At the same time, it's a structure that has been historically <coughs> developed. And the historical development is not independent of specific historical circumstances. So, my main point here, though it can do justice to the importance of the historical side of our human culture, and at the same time make it not just a result of historical circumstances of human decisions to reach certain goals, but do justice to the structural side that is there. This, of course, again, makes clear that the whole idea of time and temporal development is very important here. Now, I had in mind to work this out uh, in relation to the, the modern idea of differentiation, differentiation of societal structures, the family, the firm, the state, etc. Um, because of time, I, I think I, I shouldn't do that, um, because then there wouldn't be time left to talk about uh, the transcendental critique. So, if it's okay with you, I switch to the second topic of this moment. I think the best you can do at the moment is. Yeah. Um, from my introduction in Doyleian philosophy, it might be clear that uh, Doyle's approach in philosophy uh, was really influenced by his Christian belief in being a Christian. And he explicitly wanted it that way. That his basic Christian conviction should influence his philosophical position, his philosophical analysis of reality because he believed that this was his calling as a Christian. Now, in the 20th of our century, this, and to a large extent, this is still the case, but the situation has changed. In uh, the 20th of our century, this was a position that for most philosophers was not acceptable at all, because philosophy as science should be at least neutral in relation to whatever basic conviction, worldview, religious belief, or whatever. So Doivet had to account for his position as a philosopher. And he explicitly denied that he wanted to have philosophy as a worldview. So a philosopher that would only hold and be of relevance for a specific group of people. That had the same worldview. He wanted a uh, philosophy uh, with a claim of truth that would uh, that should be respected by all philosophers. So that would be open to communicate. Uh, he even called it a scientific philosophy in the sense that its arguments should be based on states of affairs that could be discovered by empirical science or by other observations or logical argument, not by making it neutral for that reason, but by, pre by having it as a philosophy that should be taken seriously in a philosophical discussion as a whole, in a philosophical communication and not just for a specific group. Now, then of course he had to account for his position. How could he argue for it? Now I come to the arguments in a second. Um, but let me first characterize the nature of his position. Traditionally, and that's very much common uh, today for many people, 
there was a scheme of thinking in terms of faith, religion at one side, and reason, philosophy, science at the other side. Say in, in, in the medieval uh, theological position, there are certain truths that are based on reason, <coughs> but specific truth can only be based on revelation. So there is faith in the revelation, and other truths are based on reason. And in the Middle Ages, philosophy and theology were not very much separated. They, they basically were one, and it was within theology, which is a term from Greek philosophy, by the way, theology, there was then a distinction between truth based on reason and truth based on revelation. In modern time, gradually, theology has become something that relates to truth based on revelation and philosophy and science relates to truth based on reason and observation. So there clearly if you start from the Christian faith people will think you're now doing theology and not philosophy. There are some encyclopedias encyclo there's a German one in which Doewit is under the heading of theology. And he was very much against that because he really wanted philosophy and not theology. But there you find that scheme, if you have a religious starting point, a Christian one, you're not doing philosophy, you're doing theology. Now David, you could say his position is characterized by a change in the scheme. Doyet's position is that it's not only a Christian, as he was, that has a basic conviction, conviction of a religious nature, from which he starts doing philosophy, but that all philosophy presupposes, requires a basic conviction of a nature that is similar to his Christian starting point. A basic conviction, he would call, of a religious nature. So you don't have faith here and reason there, and then faith leads to theology, then you reflect on it intellectually, and reason leads to science and philosophy. Now you have a basic conviction, faith, religion, which then is worked out in of effects in the way you do philosophy. You have one basic conviction, the Christian one, and you have other basic convictions that leads to an other approach in philosophy. And in a structural sense, you do in philosophy, there is a similarity, but in both cases, and of course there are more than two cases, th there is the influence, the impact of a basic conviction of a religious nature that influences the way that you are doing philosophy. Now of course, I now just characterized his position, and this you can't call an argument, it's is a characteristic of a position. How did he argue for that? Well, you can distinguish two lines of argument that Oivet uses. And I will start with the historical argument. You could also call it the empirical argument. Analyzing philosophy uh, as it is given in history, in contemporary in the contemporary situation. That's the one line of argument. The other line of argument is the structural one, out of the nature of philosophy as such. Not the actual philosophy as it has been pursued, but the structure of philosophy. For Doewe, the second argument was the most important, because the empirical argument cannot lead to a necessity that can't be otherwise. Uh, but I think in terms of introducing his argument, it's better to start with the other one, the historical. And that has been rather important in Doewitz's development anyhow. What Doewitz tries to show in his analysis of the philosophy of history is that philosophy cannot be understood if you just analyze it in terms of say, philosophical propositions, of philosophical conceptions. Behind them, and not 
to say that a philosophical argument is not important, but in a philosophical conception, there is functioning, there is at work, a basic conviction that has a religious nature. For instance, in modern philosophy, it's the way we call it humanistic philosophy, starting in Dewey's analysis, which is the 16th century, Renaissance thinking, the Enlightenment, and leading up to the philosophical situation in the 20th century, you have a basic motivation that you need to understand, that you need to understand, to grasp really what is going on in philosophy. And that is that at one side, there is what Dewey called the idea of personality, related to the pursuit of human freedom, the realization of the human personality, and at the other side there is the ideal of science, scientific control of reality. Both ideals motivate very much uh, philosophical thinking, but there is at the same time a basic tension there. Uh, in the beginning, scientific knowledge, scientific analysis is seen as a means to realize human freedom because by scientific knowledge you can get control over the world that you want to control, in which you want to realize your human goals, to manifest your freedom. But gradually it becomes clear that because of the ideal of scientific knowledge, is all encompassive that it also includes the scientific understanding of the human person itself. So freedom then, as in the term of uh, Skinner, the behaviorist philosopher, psychologist, freedom is that part of human life that we have not scientifically understood yet. Once we understand human behavior completely, we don't need the whole notion of freedom anymore. So there you see the tension. Now, there are some tensions in Skinner himself, but what I'm now pointing at is the tension in our, in the philosophical thought and in our culture, in fact, also. The tension between the one side, freedom and complete control, of course it's never completely realized, but that is the intent, and on the other side, the idea of science, of complete control, but then ultimately gives no room anymore for you, to you, for you. Now you could say in, in our situation, post-modernist situation, the tension really has become clear. And post-modernists, they, they both don't believe really in the ideal of freedom, although it's still working, and neither do they believe in the ideal of science. That, that, that has its own problems. But it's these motivations that work also in philosophy as a theoretical endeavor. And Kant's philosophy is a clear illustration of that. Kant, Kant was aware of the claim of scientific knowledge, and he wanted to defend the, the, the room for freedom. But this is one illustration of the fact that philosophy is not just neutral in relation to basic convictions. That is, it is a basic conviction that is not of the theoretical nature as such, but that still motivates philosophical thought, and that leads also to basic tensions in philosophical thought. This Doewit analyzed already in the 20s. Uh, later on, uh, he got interested in uh, modern medieval philosophy and in Greek philosophy, and he analyzed some basic schemes of a religious nature, both in Greek philosophy and in medieval philosophy. Greek philosophy in terms of form and matter, which he found in Aristotle. Aristotle uses those terms, but he found them also in Plato and in the pre-Platonists. And he related those notions of form and freedom to Greek religions, more nature religions and more cultural religions. Now I won't go into that. There has been a lot of discussion about the way Doyle would interpret Greek religion, has been a lot of critique, uh, and 
probably that critique is, uh, how do we say, it? Is, is just, is uh, a critique that is uh, proper. But there is still something there, I think, that you can say also in Greek philosophy, there is some deeper motivation. It's not just theoretical analysis, because Greek philosophy claimed to bring salvation or redemption in some kind of thing. Uh, redemption out of this world we live in. And then redemption in an intellectual way, but in Plato you find that, in Parmenides you find that, and uh, it can be defended that in Aristotle you find it too. So that, that is the pursuit of intellectual knowledge, which is of course emphasized in Greek philosophy, is not just something in itself. It, it has a deeper motivation that you can easily, but you can very well defend that it has a religious nature. Freud's so analysis of medieval philosophy was kind of different because medieval philosophy comes from the Christian background and wants to be true to the Christian belief. The way the way it analyzes the motivation there is that medieval philosophy basically is characterized by the attempt to combine the Christian religious conviction with Greek philosophy without being critical about the religious motivation of that philosophy. So it was not just a use of theoretical insights, but it was trying to bring together the Christian religious conviction with the Greek religious conviction. Of course, not being aware that it was a religious conviction, but still trying to synthesize them, to bring them together. And, of course, if he is right in claiming that there is a religious conviction behind Greek philosophy, then, then you can't integrate that with a religious conviction in a biblical sense. That, that must conflict with one another. Now there too, there has been a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, critique, uh, I think, at least partly, uh, the critique was justified. But still there too, to bring in the religious conviction as affecting theoretical philosophical analysis has been fruitful, I think. And now then, Doyle's own conviction, I already said it was biblical, uh, he character characterized it in terms of cre creation, that the whole world is God's creation, there is nothing that is outside of creation. You could also say it's the relationship creator-creature that is basic. The fallenness of man and with man, earthly reality, and the total redemption through Christ in communion with the Holy Spirit. In, in formulating his own biblical starting point, he was clearly in the tradition of the Reformation of the 16th century, and especially in his Calvinist form, the radical nature of sin, uh, and for that reason, or related to that, the total and radical nature of the redemption through Christ. <coughs> now, I won't go into that uh, anymore. I just want to say something about the structural argument. Um, because if in practice philosophy never attained neutrality in relation to basic conviction, you might still claim that philosophy ought to do so, that the ideal should be maintained for philosophy. And for that reason, do I try to argue that philosophy as such is not possible without a religious starting point. And he has tried to refine his argument. I won't go into that development. I just want to show the basic structure of his argument. He looked for an inner point of contact between a religious conviction and 
theoretical analysis, in the sense of philosophy, as a structured analysis of the world as a whole. Uh, because if he could find an inner point of contact, he could not only argue for the uh, legitimacy of the Christian influence, but also that there is a necessity there, a structural, a structural relationship. And the way he had found that inner point of contact in what he first called the cosmonomic idea, the Vets idea, idea of law, if you take a law in a wide sense. Later on he called it the transcendental ground idea. And the content of that basic idea is threefold. It's an idea of origin, an idea of unity, and an idea of diversity in coherence. Uh, for all philosophy is needed, to start with the last one, an account of the diversity in reality, though it accounted for that in the theory of the moral aspects. But in Aristotle you have also <coughs> some account of the diversity in reality, the different categories Aristotle distinguishes. Uh, all philosophy somehow has to account for that diversity. Now in many philosophies it is attempted to understand the diversity as being reducible to, or coming out of, one aspect of what do I get analyzed as the modal diversity. Say, naturalism or physicalism tries to understand everything in terms of physics. But there is also an, an approach in terms of uh, our knowledge, mental concepts, and that all the knowledge of reality we have can basically be understood in a psychological sense because it comes from our sensations, uh, outer sensations and inner ideas. So always there is a tendency to absolutize one of the aspects. But you need a certain idea about that diversity and how they cohere. That's one idea. A second idea, uh, though I would say that that diversity presupposes a unity. Now the idea of unity you find very much in Greek philosophy, Plato, Neoplatonism, so that's not new either in philosophy. But Dewey does have the idea of unity in a rather unique sense, or a specific sense, that uh, it's a concentration point of the diversity, and a unity that is beyond temporal diversity. Here I have to come back to Dewey's idea of time, and this is a point where I have difficulties with Dewey Weert. Uh, that Dewey relates diversity very much to time, not only to change and development, also uh, he relates time to diversity. He needs an idea of unity, and then he starts to speak about the supratemporal nature of that idea of unity. He relates that idea of unity to the biblical teaching, because that unity is at one side structurally in the heart of the universe, and that then is also supertemporal, but basically that unity has to be found in Jesus Christ. And the Bible speaks, of course, about the creation being uh, created in Christ, the unity of all things in Christ, uh, which then clearly is a religious idea. That's the second idea, and he says, every philosophy needs such an idea of unity that is somehow beyond the diversity, even the coherence in the diversity. And then the last idea, idea of origin. Where ultimately do things come from? Now, the idea of origin, of course, is related to the <coughs> biblical idea of God as the creator. But you find an idea of origin also in Plato. In fact, for and matter, or notions that you cannot go beyond, they are original in that sense, they, they play the function of an origin, but then there is a twofold origin. And to mention one of the contemporary philosophers, uh, Richard Rorty in North America, he has a very explicit idea of origin, although he doesn't use the word origin there, I think, but it's clear that for Rorty, time and chance have the function of origin. 
because for Lord it's not not meaningful to ask questions beyond time and chance. Everything comes forth from time and chance. So that's the idea that you could say has that place as an idea of origin. Formally, I think you could formulate an idea of origin as that notion beyond which it's not meaningful to ask questions. As when you believe in God, it doesn't make sense to ask questions beyond God. Where does God come from is not a meaningful question in the Christian context. Of course, it's a meaningful question for a naturalist. But it's, it's not a meaningful question for a Christian, because it, it's, you can't pass beyond God. And so for what you can't pass beyond time and chance. As for a Christian, you can ask beyond time and chance. And, and so is, you can argue that some kind of idea of origin is always implied in a philosophical position. I think it's even part of our human understanding of reality. Often it's not reflected upon, but it does have a function. Our understanding of reality implies some idea of origin. Now, why is this idea an inner point of contact? Well, at one side, it's an idea that is necessary for a philosophical conception of reality. So, philosophy cannot do without it. At the other side, the content of those ideas is not coming from philosophical analysis, but comes from a basic conviction that is there. Of course, it can be philosophically accounted for, that you don't have a neutral position and then you argue for a specific idea of origin. It's, it's of a religious nature. You can try to account for it, but you cannot deduce it in a theoretical way. So, the idea as such is necessary for philosophy, but the content of the idea comes from a basic conviction. And though you could say that's by definition a religious conviction. And then, of course, you can uh, try to apply this analysis to philosophy, though you did it, in fact. And in, in my own experience, it's a helpful, critical framework to understand philosophy, uh, to, to ask what is their notion of origin, what is their uh, notion of diversity and coherence. As I said, and this is my last point, and now coming to some critique on Doyer, um, the idea of unity, as Doyer applies it, uh, does not really satisfy me. Uh, I, I have the impression that Doyer uses a, a scheme from anthropology and applies this to cosmology, not in the sense of the natural science, but as an analysis of the world as a whole. In anthropology, you can say, to understand the diversity and the unity of the human person, you can speak of a diversity of functions in coherence, but there is the unity of the person. And though it uses then a biblical term of the heart as a unity of the person, and without projecting his anthropology in the Bible, I think it's clear that, that there is, is a relationship. The heart is a unity of human life, the human person, the basic decisions are made there. You can certainly account for that in a biblical way. You could also say, the unity of the person is not kind of adding up the diverse functions. The unity of the person uh, becomes clear because we speak as an I and we address the other as a you. And there is a unity there. Otherwise we would not be personal beings. At the same time we exist within a diversity. But Doivit, I think, takes that unity that is helpful to understand the human person to analyze the reality as a whole. That there is a diversity of functions, but there is also a kind of a unity in which all the diversity is concentrated. <coughs> that uh, is connected with uh, his view of time, his view of religion, 
uh, view of religion is the human relation to God is very much understood in terms of diversity and unity in the direction of unity and to God. Um, I myself think that the, the whole theme of unity and diversity should not be so uh, dominant in our understanding of religion, our relationship to God. I would rather understand it as an answering relationship. We respond to God, who is in a central sense, but also with our whole being in the diversity of our functioning. Uh, and that gives the possibility to uh, not relate time to diversity, but leave that element out. And so I have no need for the idea of supertemporality either. And in relation to the threefold idea, I would maintain the notion of origin, I talked about that already, that diversity and the coherence and unity in some respect. But the idea of unity, I would rephrase, maintaining a basic element in Doiwir, but still interpreting it differently, that in all philosophy there is an element of self-understanding. The way we understand our being human. Uh, that is not only part of philosophy, it's part of our being human, that we have that element of self-understanding. And so in, instead of the, the notion of unity, origin, unity, diversity and coherence, I would say there is a notion of origin, a notion of our self-understanding as a human being, and the notion of diversity in coherence. And there I think there is indeed an inner point of contact between a basic conviction that cannot be deduced in a theoretical way from other uh, starting points, it can be accounted for, but not in going back behind it. Uh, it's a basic conviction that, that somehow characterizes the way we see origin, ourselves, the diversity, and at the same time, these notions are necessary in philosophy. If you can argue for that in uh, philosophies that you analyze, not that all things are always explicitly reflected upon, but they are there. And you can demand answers to those questions from a philosophical position. In fact, I think it's part of us being human that we have notions about those three elements of self-understanding, that how we interpret the diversity in reality, and about the origin, where we come from, in what way we are ultimately responsible, to whom, or is there not an ultimate horizon in which we can respond for the way we live. So, let's thank you. With it. Well, I have, uh, after your lecture of this morning, the same feeling as I had yesterday when we were in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> For a very reasonable price, we got a lot of dishes, <laughs> and we were not able to digest all. <laughs> Anyhow, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> and, and we had a good experience in the Chinese restaurant. But I think it's a pity if we would not try to digest at least a little bit of what we know. So, so I suggest that we take half an hour. Do you agree with me? Oh, that's fine with me. <laughs> I wasn't there last night. Oh, no. <laughs> but, but maybe there is at least one difference. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Chinese food, you can only digest once. But this is recorded. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with fully with you. You can use it always later. But let's try to digest it at least now for half an hour. Well, we have to eat at one o'clock, so if you agree with me, we can make it somewhat shorter, that you have ten minutes, five minutes walk before we go to dinner. But let's do at least twenty minutes, and then ten minutes break, and then go to dinner. Yeah? Over it? Okay. Dinner. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so I was like, I because it was already... <laughs> now, who likes to raise a question and take it as short as possible? I.
uh, one question uh, do we think time is created so uh, it's under the law but limited uh, other question I'm a bit confused about uh, history uh, in course of time uh, historical developments unfolding uh, emergence of kingdoms uh, well that's history and the use of historical to point to the modality of human formation after the free design which I think happens in that other history yeah. but in itself is more, uh, I think, technology, human formation, is manipulating given objects to formate things, or when there are no given objects to formate, uh, making, designing laws, social structures, languages. So then we have a modality, but we shouldn't call it historical. Um, well, the first question, I can give a short answer. Uh, the second question is uh, more complicated. Uh, for Doewit, indeed, time is created. Uh, time is part of the creation. And uh, in relation to time, he distinguishes between a law side and a subject side as he does in relation to modern aspects. But uh, the temporality is certainly part of what is created. So the creation is not a happening in time. Because with creation, yeah. time was created. In the beginning, in the really beginning. Uh, in a temporal sense, yes. In, in that uh, context, Doyer follows an Augustinian position. That, that our, uh, although Doyer speaks about supertemporality, somehow that we transcend time, and, and there I have some problems. But in the sense that uh, time starts with the creation. And it's, it doesn't make sense to use temporal terminology beyond what is created. Of course, you can discuss about that, uh, how about uh, the God's activities, you, you could all. But this is clearly Doyer's position. And up till now, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a rather acceptable position. Um, the second question, um, yeah, I said it's more complicated. Um, in fact, the first question, you could have a long discussion about that also. But the second question is very much discussed in relation to Doyle's position. Um, and I'm aware of the problems here. I tried to skip them over in my presentation. That uh, you were right in putting the finger there, that there are some problems there. Um, I don't think I can solve them all. Uh, I think in its own position, there remain some problems. And they relate to uh, the use of the historical modal aspect and uh, the use of history. But at the same time, I should say, uh, Doyle does not identify history, in a wide sense, development, with <coughs> the historical moral aspect. Um, his idea of disclosure, temporal development, is wider than the historical aspect, because it also applies to nature, and that uh, it's not uh, dependent on human formation. Um, at the same time, I think it's fruitful to see that in the development of human culture, there is human formation. Um, and I don't think that that is always uh, technical or manipulating objects, uh, because human formation in the sense of uh, development of uh, laws in the state, for instance, or development of uh, 
uh, uh, moral normativity. It, it, it's not, of course, in a technical design, there's also the attempt to find what is right. Uh, even there you can wonder if it's all manip manipulating an object. But certainly in, in these areas, you know, it, it's, there is as much a discovery as there is a design. But still there is human formation and, and also the element, uh, certain ideas in this respect that become powerful in the historical sense, that they become influential. May I say, uh, you say discovery, yeah. I prefer to say creation. Man image of God. Yeah. Man is in a way creating his norms, his laws. And that's foundation founded in uh, the free of the design. Yeah, well um, man is created there but it's not it's not a creation out of nothing. It's giving form to what is there. As an artist even uh, in what I understand from artists, the way they create an artwork is not that it is say kind of this is what I want and I just know. They are also they are looking for the solution of the artistic problems. So an artwork is as much a discovery for the artist as a result of a creative activity. Uh, so, th th this, and I think in relation to understanding what is the proper solution in a normative sense, also to solve political problems, um, people who are known as uh, important in the development of law, I think they, they as much have experienced things that they, they formulate as discoveries as, as free creations. And I think that this fits with the idea that our human creations always find a place within a framework of the creation that is given to us. So in, in relation to us being the image of God in, in Genesis 1, but of course the position of you mankind is, is uh, rather central, subdued the earth. Uh, I think the specific position of man as made in the image of God is indeed that man has a specific responsibility to develop, explore uh, the created world, but it's always in line with the intent of the creation as it is made by God. So it's never an absolute freedom. We, in, in our creative activities, should always look for what is proper, what is good, what suits the intent of the Creator with this reality. And so, in, in working out giving form to specific normative principles, uh, we should always be guided by those principles and understand their meaning, how they should be applied and worked out in a specific historical situation. Now, I haven't answered all your problems, but at least though it does not reduce history in a wide sense, or temporal development, uh, to the historical moral aspect. And even in relation to human cultural activity, uh, it's not only the historical aspect that is important, uh, formation, free formation, after design, but also the creedal aspect. Our understanding of reality affects the way a civilization is uh, developing, and then of course the other aspects. But but there are some questions here that uh, that in a more detailed discussion should certainly be considered. Okay, still ten minutes left for discussion. Some pleasure. Another person who likes to raise an important question for him or her. I have no. a question, General. Um, uh, there's a word that occurs, uh, used a lot, which is structure. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole philosophy to be looking at structure at the time. 
And uh, of course, there are certain things that have structure, uh, there is legitimate. But uh, it seems to me that in the philosophy of Toyo, this idea of structure uh, is very strong. Um, and uh, structure seems to me, in fact, lose the idea of personal. Uh, of the personal. Uh, I can't speak about. I can speak about the structure of my marriage, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not the appropriate way of looking at marriage. And so I wonder whether this is an influence of Greek philosophy, because certainly Plato and Aristotle looked at the structure. That was what they were interested. Um, well, uh, I think one of the uh, the issues of our modern culture, uh, especially in philosophy and but also in science, that the, the human sciences, uh, cognitive psychology, is to find a solution to the tension that is often there between the notion of the person and the personal and the structural. Uh, Indeed, in often uh, the structural approach is seen as not leaving a room for the personal. And when people start about the person, then, then the structure seems to be inappropriate. Um, there, is, there are some developments, though, that point in another direction. In the direction, I think, that uh, is akin to the Doi approach, and that is that the structural side makes the personal possible. Uh, a well-known illustration of that is uh, Wittgenstein's idea of the rules of the chess, the chess game. The chess game is a, is a human activity, uh, which is not uh, predictable in its outcome, unless you know the players very well, but then you have the unique uh, abilities of the players. But it does have specific rules, and it's only on the basis of the rules that a chess game is possible. They don't predict it, but they make it possible. And uh, I think that could be helpful to understand the way the structural analysis of the Doi philosophy should be understood. It's not that the structural analysis somehow predicts the outcome, leaves no freedom, but it's the structural side of the creation that makes our life as human beings possible. And then, of course, the structural analysis that we can give of phenomena is always limited. It's not that I don't think it's even helpful to give a complete structural analysis, say, of a marriage. But a marriage to be a real marriage, I think, and we have discussions, maybe you have them in your country, we have them in our country. What is part of a marriage? Is it just something personal? Or does it also have a legal side, a public side, that people that, that really want to have a marriage in a biblical sense of full trust to one another, a commitment to one another for life, it involves the whole person, and it involves the sexual intimacy, but also living together, taking responsibility for one another in a relation of respect and love. Is it just something personal? Or does it have a public side? Does it have a legal side? Does it have the other side? And it's not that you need a, 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 a big theoretical analysis of that. But it is helpful in such a discussion. I have discovered that in discussion we had in our <coughs> congregation about it, that to have some analysis in a theoretical sense it helps to, in a concrete sense, make uh, clear what the nature of a marriage is. That it's not just something personal in a limited sense of private, etc. But that it also has the other sides and that you have to take them into account. And especially that marriage in all cultures have a public side and that you need that side to protect the, the married couple in relation to society, but also in relation to one another. 
So there is a structural side here that is functioning within a marriage. And one of the problems of, of our, at least in that situation, I think, in this respect is that people think that those relationships are just personal. And then, of course, they discover that it's not just personal because there are some legal implications involved and then they won't have a public marriage but they go to the lawyer to uh, design a contract. Uh, so, you know, they, they, you, you can't avoid it. But there is some confusion about that that is not a given structure that, of course, has a historical side to it, but that within a certain cultural framework you should uh, integrate in your approach or do justice to. So I think that there is not a, a, a contrast. Of course, you can speak about structures in such a way that it excludes the personal. But I would rather say the opposite, that the personal always presupposes a structural side. And therefore, I like to uh, characterize structures as the answering structures of creation, that on the basis of structures, we can be fully human and responsible. Thank you so much so far, because there are still two minutes. <laughs> Can I respond to that? Uh, because I think it may be... It is, uh, all you said about marriage, I fully agree with it, but I would say that that should be ruled by the character of God, which is different to the structure. And the example of the chessboard that you mentioned is exactly the one which I mentioned. A chessboard is made of a structure of game, with constraints of moves which are artificially set up. Mm. It's a game. Yeah. It's not life. And what happens with these things uh, is, is, is a very good paper coming with Stafford Beer about these things is that eventually the game becomes a surrogate reality that people start saying the game is reality and that happens very much in scientific modeling where yeah. artificial yeah. constraints of idioms yeah. start being put. Now science cannot deal with a person. I mean, this is the problem of the type of science that we have generated. But what we reflect is yeah. the character of God, which is a, it's not the personal which you, I agree with you entirely, it's the character of a personal God that is reflected in every aspect of marriage. And that's much richer than speaking about just structure. And, 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 yeah. but, and, like the same for the response, but I prefer that you continue this debate on table. Now, I, let, let mm -hmm. this debate no, one short now, you should go because uh, I agree that it relates to the character of God. That uh, I would make a connection with the meaning of commandments in the biblical approach. Because the commandments in the Bible, they are kind, they can be seen as a constraint, but that's not their real meaning. They can be seen as kind of a, a, a help to be defended from evil and danger. That, that's also another side. But basically, and for instance, Buber has pointed that out, the commandments are directives to life. So they, that means that if you follow the commandments, life will come to its destination. There is an intrinsic relation between the commandments and true life. And so I relate structures in this respect to commandments. That indeed, as in, in the other lecture, I said that uh, modal aspects, they have a qualitative side and a normative side. And they go together. So, of course, in a, in a structural analysis, you are working abstract, but what is in the back of my mind is that the structures make possible the qualitative nature of human life and for that reason imply the normativity and that that's part of the structure. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I'll allow you two minutes to extend the, the chess game because it was a lot of flexible, the constraints weren't too rigid, but I think we have to stop now. And we are very thankful, of course, at the end of the three lectures that you gave us for what you have. And um, we are happy uh, that there are videotapes so uh, we can look later and 
try to reflect on what you have said, Maybe. but you are not there. No. So that's still a problem for us, mm -hmm. but perhaps there will be a next opportunity in which we can meet each other. Uh, let's not make uh, any promise or decision about it, but perhaps the uh, future will give us new chances. Thank you so far, and I'd like to express it uh, uh, by the classical symbol, namely... Uh,